ask so that we can uh, leave the most time possible uh, for your questions. Um, Nicole and Chris are from Cade. Cade, based in New York, is basically a nonprofit consulting firm in the area of sustainable agriculture. They um, uh, provide strategic technical assistance to clients, farmers, distributors, slaughterhouses, creameries, and commercial kitchens in the area of business development, financing, accounting, e-commerce, distribution, and marketing. Nicole and Chris were our presenters uh, a couple weeks ago. Nicole Day's degree is in economics. After working specifically in that field for a while, she started a natural foods manufacturing business. Uh, then uh, she started at Cade, the Center for Agricultural Development and Entrepreneurship, uh, as I, uh, I described them just a moment ago. Uh, she started as a consultant. Now she's the director for programming and communications. And Chris Harmon is the executive director of Cade. His degree is in land resource management and energy resources from Ball State. After a long stint with the Nature Conservancy, he bought a farm and has been raising grass-fed beef, pastured poultry, and hogs since 2002. He scaled back his farm but not abandoned it uh, so that he can spend some time uh, working at being the executive director of Cade to help others find great success as producers and processors. Arian Thabumari has a PhD from Iowa State. He is vice president of Lawrence Meats in Cannon Falls, uh, Minnesota, uh, a medium small sized meat processor specializing in, specializing in natural and organic meats. Lawrence is a fantastic company featured by Michael Pollan in the Omnivore's Dilemma and a case study in the Wallace Center Community Food Enterprise Project. He also co-coordinates the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network, a cooperative extension network working to support small meat processors. And Steve Warshower wears many hats here at the National Good Food Network. He's the, he is the NGFN Food Safety Coordinator, but he has a lot of experience in the regional meat business as well, hailing from the Santa Fe area. Steve is a beef, beef producer himself. He's on the Beef Industry Improvement Initiative in, in New Mexico, and he also has a seat at the national level on the National Advisory Council on Meat and Poultry Inspection. Okay, so uh, we're going to begin our conversation today with our uh, panelists uh, with a few questions from our webinar from February 17th, um, which many of you have attended or you may have watched in our, our archive recording. This will give you a bit of time to start asking your questions. Uh, remember that you uh, enter your questions in the questions box, but there may be some answers uh, sort of typed there in the questions box as well. So uh, keep, your, keep your eyes there. Um, and uh, let's let's start off. Um, so, uh, with the question of seasonality, uh, one of the major points uh, that Chris Harmon made uh, in the February 17 webinar uh, is that meat, uh, contrary to some people's uh, belief, uh, is actually a hi highly seasonal. Uh, on this webinar, we have three regions of the country represented here: Northeast, Midwest. Uh, and Southwest, and um, you all have seasonality issues. Meat producers, particularly large animal producers, want to over avoid overwintering so they don't have to feed bought or processed hay, haylage, or the like. So let me start with Chris here, but it would be interesting to hear from all three regions as to strategies you've seen to ease the boom-bust cycle at the processors. So Chris? Okay. Uh, the question is strategies we've seen to end the boom bust of the yeah, seasonality. Yeah, if not end, at least ease. Okay. Well, uh, here in the Northeast, the folks who have successfully started to end that, and you know, to an extent, uh, really have good markets. Um, they have consistent markets uh, year round, and are moving three to five beefers or so a week into the slaughterhouses. Some folks, some producers have started to calve in the fall, uh, looking to butcher beefers at 18 to 22 months to avoid that second winter, um, uh, which is, is really the, the restricting factor. Um, but I would say that the big area is, is developing your markets. If you're talking about the feast and famine of slaughterhouses, it's developing markets year round, and even if that means you need to raise your prices during the winter time. 
Okay. Arian, you are at the processor uh, level with Lawrence. Um, how do you deal with the boom bus cycle? Um, <coughs> one of the factors, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. One of the factors that, uh, that we talk a lot about here is based about, we work a lot with individual producers, but we also work with branded programs. And the branded programs, the very nature of a branded program, particularly a branded fresh program, is that you have to have product available every single week, which means that they process with us every single week. We do see, uh, we do have some seasonality in February is our slowest month. We're just getting through that, starting to get a few more orders, uh, a few more um, individual producers that are doing direct marketing that come through here, but it does get a little slow in February. One thing that we've talked about a lot, and I know some people have implemented, is differences in seasonal pricing, i.e. saying that you charge less in the months when you have less demand and charge more in the months when you have more demand. A lot of people in other industries work with seasonality that way. Uh, one final comment I would make is that if you are a producer and you really have, let's say you're having a hard time getting slaughter dates booked in the fall when a lot of processors are really busy, if you go to that processor and you guarantee them that you'll show up with animals in the spring when they're slow, I guarantee you that they will hold spots for you in the fall. Just that they're you know, organizing something where you can bring more value to that business transaction and create a good relationship with that processor, um, that's a win-win situation for everybody. Yeah, I, I, um, I think we might see as a theme that um, your relationship, uh, the relationship between producer and processor is is key. Steve, are, are you are you connected? Or you want to weigh in on the seasonality issue in um, in New Mexico? Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, great. Um, we actually have here in New Mexico one working fresh. Uh, fresh meat value chain that is all grass finished um, where what we've done is sort of followed the grass if you will. Uh, so since out west here we're used to having to cover pretty great distances to get to processors and to markets. Those larger distances also give us access to different growing conditions in which there is fresh forage at, and perhaps a little bit less uh, weather pressure at different times of year. So um, we've just finished our first winter of supplying fresh market grass-finished beef through a value chain including a, a producer co-op, a small local processor, and a local consumer co-op uh, moving three to five beef a week. And the, part, the, the, the producers are talking now about changing their calving cycles a bit. You know, some are starting to split their calving into spring and fall calving. And then along with that, we're looking at identifying um, sort of specialized forage opportunities where we can finish under better conditions even through the winter. And we did encounter with our processor a conflict this winter because he's also a game processor. So when, when hunting season kicked in, he didn't want us around so much. But we negotiated through that and we had to make some changes in our, our trucking schedules, our hanging times, our dry aging and our wet aging schedules. But eventually we were able to hold our position with that processor not lose any business for him from his other um, uh, uh, clientele and maintain product quality straight through the winter up here at 7,000 feet with a relatively serious winter, perhaps not as much as what Minnesota and upstate New York have, but we call it winter here. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, uh, I want to uh, just uh, point out to our audience that um, Contact information for all of our presenters is is up on the slide, um, so uh, you can feel free to use that. Um, uh, this question is also from the uh, last webinar. Um, I, I think I'm just going to read the the question out uh, as written. Uh, it says I live in an area where the ranchers are not interested in marketing and selling their beef as local, but will if we, the local food coalition, serves uh, as the middleman. Are there any other groups like a food coalition that are, is, is there a model um, that, is, that, that any of you know about? Um, Arian, have you, have you heard of a, a sort of cooperative marketing? Well, well, you're basically just describing any branded brief program that isn't producer owned right there. 
uh -huh. uh, from from the sense of you know I could start a meat company tomorrow where I contract I have a, an agreement with producers and they raise the animals and I do the marketing you know do the brand, handle all the logistics and do the branding and do the processing so from that perspective I mean the model is you're in the meat business um, it's not like that's a super uh, innovative model I would you know that said it's a very difficult model to follow because developing any branded be any branded meat program is uh, if it were that easy a lot more people would be doing it, <laughs> it, it, it I would say it does sound like their middleman equals distribution outlet on on. So I, w I guess I would have to know what they mean by middleman. Right. Yeah. And Jeff, I if I could, I would add that they could look at somebody like NELPS, the Northeast Livestock Processing Service Company, which coordinates with farmers, uh, slots and spaces within slaughterhouses and then assist those farmers in marketing that meat for them and NELPS can be found online uh, as well and look at that model. One thing I would add though is that the Land Stewardship Project has been doing this in Minnesota where they've been hosting sessions, uh, they've done this I think a couple times now, where they've gotten some branded programs in the room such as Thousand Hills Cattle Company which is a 100% grass fed beef program that we work with at Lawrence Meats and then additionally Nyman Ranch, so here's a beef company and uh, Nyman Ranch pork producers, um, they also do beef, but in this case pork, um, they had them in the room answering programs about, the, answering questions about their branded program for producers, for those producers who said, hey, I want to grow the stuff, but marketing's not my strong point, who can I connect with? And I think that those have been uh, pretty successful and a good role for a nonprofit to take in that situation. Okay, good. Um, uh, there were also a couple questions about um, s starting up slaughterhouses. Uh, one was, uh, where do you get funding? And I know this is a major issue. Um, Chris, maybe you want to talk about some funding options for um, starting up slaughterhouses, maybe either nationally or in the Northeast? Sure. Um, well, first off, you, you need to come to the table with some assets. Um, it, obviously, you know, banks could loan you money for it, but it's a question of your collateral. Um, what we find is successful are primarily are USDA exempt uh, slaughterhouses that are coming with some equity, uh, with some equipment. Uh, but it was, you know, the the we have one client who got a grant from the state of New York from the Office of Community and Renewal and that was pretty much based upon the job creation that they would be doing and that was about 230,000 otherwise they're cash flowing it through their other businesses but they're unique in the case of Larry's Custom Meats um, Larry came with some assets to the table uh, but it was a a regional uh, collaboration of loans through the Bank of Cooperstown loans to the Otsego County Development Corporation, the Mohawk Valley Economic Development District, and we did write an RBAG application. Um, so the, the financing for that came through many, many areas uh, together. Uh, it would be very difficult to find financing from one entity unless you, uh, unless you have a tremendous amount of collateral. Obviously, with slow money being a huge thing in the nation these days, I think there is the potential for outside investors. Uh, it ultimately depends upon what you're looking at at your rate of return. Uh, some of the money that came from Medved was federal money, so you're looking at a, you know two to three percent interest. Bank loans were six to eight percent interest. County loans were you know around the four percent. So, it, it, and you have to work at it. You have to really shop it around. We shopped the business plan around to a couple banks, accepted certain rejections, and then went back, retweaked the business plan. And it's it's definitely an issue with banks not understanding agricultural businesses as well. So you do have to find the ones that do understand those businesses. Mm -hmm. um. Um, Jeff, uh, Jeff yeah. are you able to just bring up that slide that I put together? Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. How's that? Okay. 
Well, you may look even fancier. Yeah. Right. Um, I just wanted, I put this slide together because I think there were a number of questions that were ling lingering from the last uh, webinar when I was looking at the list of questions and it's, I need more processing capacity, where do I start? And so just wanted to walk through this because I think a lot of people say they automatically assume I need a plant, you know, I and they just want to build one and where can I get the money and well, um, Unless you got a rich uncle and you're not afraid of failure, um, you know, l let's look at some other options first. Basically, is the point of this chart. So, you know, is there a ghost, good lo local processor available? If the answer is yes, work with them. Book slaughter early and book it often, and, and that's great. But I think most of the people who say I need to build a new plant are probably in one of the other situations, and one of those other situations are no, it's too far away, and no, none are available, which are basically the two ways of saying the same thing, in my opinion. And the best option, and I honestly believe this, and I know people that have done this are the, and that are doing this, and some of them are even shipping us animals at Lawrence Meats, is work with other producers to ship animals collectively, collectively to a distant processor that you like, and then book early and book often. And the reason I say this is because if you are worried about where am I going to get the money, and sign and let's say even a bank is willing to loan you the money and you take out a million bucks that you're going to pay off every single month for the next 25 to 30 years before you sign on that dotted line why don't you why I really suggest that folks try first to see if they can ship animals to a plant together with other producers because a lot of people say well it's 2 hours or 4 hours or 6 hours or 8 hours away well that's a long ways but if you work with other producers and maybe you even hire a third party livestock hauler your only investment cost to find out if that works was the price of trucking. Let's say you build a plant, your cost, the risk that you just made was everything you leveraged against that huge bank loan that you took out and that you signed and you're going to pay for for the next 25 to 30 years. And so, you know, in terms of risk, one's way less risky and one's a good way of getting your feet in the water and testing it. And maybe you like that processor and maybe using a third party livestock collar isn't that bad and you can even then have them box it, put it on a pallet and ship it back to you LTL. We do that for some people and it really works out well and that way they don't have all the headache of managing a meat plant because it's a lot of work. Um, another thing that I think is often is I don't like the processor Aaron, that's near me. Hang on. Yeah, sorry, I, just, I guess I don't uh, want to take up too much time with this. Yeah. No, 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 no this, um, is, this is great yeah. and I think it's super useful. I, yeah. just, I just wanted to, um, uh, you, you dropped uh, an email industry term LTL, which is less than a full load in a, in a semi. Yes, excuse me, yeah, that just means no, like no, you're sorry. sending one pallet or, or a couple pallets. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, the other thing is that if you don't like the processor you're working with, try and see if you can have a discussion with that processor to work out and resolve those differences. I mean, just like with any relationship in a business relationship, you got to work through it. Sure, there's going to be difficulties. Can you work with them? Um, you know, can you work within their constraints? Can you ask them how you can participate in solutions? Like we, like I mentioned before, on seasonality, can you bring some when they're slow, and then very likely that they'll make room for you when they're busy because you're building a good relationship with them, and they need you when they're slow. And then respect their challenge, their challenges for change. You know, be patient, especially since you're only one of many customers. Can you work with other customers to try and collectively make a solution for that processor? If you really don't, you know, if you don't like a local processor, then go back to this first step again. Can you ship animals to some place that you do like? And then this little note at the end, you know, not until volume. I think absolute minimum, absolute minimum. I would not do less than this, and really think you should have more than this. When volumes exceed 400 head of beef, or 1,200 hogs, or 2,000 or goats or lambs, sort of change, you know, or a mixture therein, and that's um, per year, you can start to consider your own, your own plant start to consider. And so just, I think a lot of folks ask, well, I want a mobile unit, or how do I get loans, or how do I start a feasibility study? I strongly suggest that folks go through this table first, try these other options, and really, if absolutely nothing else works, then I think maybe you can consider a feasibility study. But it's way cheaper to ship them a day away than it is to build a plant and have to deal with all that debt you just took on and all that management headache. Yeah, that seems very prudent. <laughs> um, Evan uh, asks, or, or Mick brings up the point that uh, you may have irreconcilable differences with the USDA inspector at the closest plant. Um, any, any advice for that? Uh, that's the processor's problem, not yours. Well, I mean, it's, it's a, a processor. 
Oh, uh, Evan, may, okay, Evan may be a processor. Yeah, yeah um, you know, I mean, small farms. Yeah, and if that's that's one thing, you know, USDA, um, you hear horror stories every once in a while. You know, we have two inspectors, and we have got two inspectors in our plant, and a vet supervisor at the station here. And you know, I've heard a lot of horror stories, but to be honest, the folks that we work with every day are good folks, uh, and really don't have too many issues with them. Uh, and and I I think that there are okay, you know, there's always some bad apples out there. Can you work? You know, can you work with? Can you? You know, just like it's almost like just like I said, with it's a business relationship. Work with them on their constraints. You know, if you're on if you're on a downward spiral already, it's really really difficult. Um, but one thing to remind you of two of a couple things is that the FSIS strictly has a non-retaliation policy. So if you file, if you really, if you keep a, uh, somebody keeps writing you up. And you feel like those NRs or the non-compliance reports that USDA writes you up for are unjust? Appeal them, and don't just appeal them to the districts. Don't just appeal them to the vet supervisor. If you feel like that person's not hearing you, appeal them to the district office. And if you feel like you're getting actions of retaliation from anybody else, FSIS is a stated non-retaliation policy. If you can document or somehow prove that you're being retaliated against. Um, and I'm not in favor of starting a war with FSIS, but if you are in desperate circumstances, there are some mechanisms out there. Also sounds prudent not starting a war. <laughs> and um, Jeff, just, just to jump in, it would depend upon the ir irreconcilable differences. I mean, without the detail, it's kind of difficult to answer that type of a question because it, it, it could be something that's on the processor side, it could be the individual inspector, but it's, you know, irreconcilable differences could be, is a very broad subject, so it's kind of difficult to know the answer to that. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With our recent experiences, actually, we have found that the USDA has been more willing uh, throughout the recent years to help the processors along um, in figuring out specific issues. Mm -hmm. and we, know that, we know that FSIS is aware that it doesn't have the best customer service reputation and that you know, steps certainly are being taken to create through the Office of Advocacy and Outreach, you know, different kinds of training and support mechanisms for producers, uh, for processors. Um, but I also want to echo the point that, that if people are being treated unfairly, there is a mechanism for recourse. And in some respects, the sooner one acts on that feeling of being treated unfairly, um, the better one can find out what needs to be done to remedy the problem and go, go back to work. Okay. Um, there um, uh, was a, a sh bit of a presentation, uh, Chris, from your webinar a couple weeks ago. We talked about um, mobile slaughter and mobile mobile processing units, um, and uh, I, I, it's a it's definitely a hot topic. I think people want to know. So um, uh, you, you, I'm going to bring up uh, if if I can figure out how to do this. <laughs> I mean, of course, I can figure out how to do this. Um, well, why don't you start talking about mobile processing, uh, how, if, if you think they're a good idea, um, how one would do a feasibility study to determine if for their area it's a good idea? Sure. Um, do I think it's a good idea? I think that it, it all depends upon where you're at and if, uh, if for I, I see mobile slaughter units, which is really what they are. You still need a bricks and mortar uh, USDA processor. Uh, I see them as, as more of a last resort. There are particular areas such as Lopez Island or such as the Hudson Valley where it would be difficult to build a, a slaughter facility uh, or there's not enough animals or, or what have you. Um, but mobile, you know, you're talking about a mobile slaughter unit that, at the least, maybe 150 to 200 thousand dollars. A kill floor is about 150 thousand dollars within a slaughter facility, um, and and what you're dealing with a lot with the mobile slaughter is is really limited space. As far as small animals, goats, lambs, hogs, and smaller cattle. Sure, uh, you can you can use them, and they'll actually work pretty well. Once you start getting into 700-pound carcasses and above, it becomes a, a much more 
difficult thing to maneuver, and it's just due to your height. Uh, you still need a place to be able to age the carcasses um, prior to the processing. Uh, a lot of people tend to view these as traveling from farm to farm. They really don't, although the, the one on Lopez Island does. We have been contacted by some people here in the state of New York uh, to discuss the idea of mobile slaughter units. Um, and again, it's the question of, well, where is your nearest processor? Um, there is a belief that it's more humane, um, and I would, I would challenge some of the humane type of killing because there's an implication that if you're not humane certified, then the others are inhumane, which is not accurate. Um, and, and, and as a farmer, I was under a misperception that if I had a slaughter day on a Tuesday, if I took my animal in that Tuesday morning, that animal would be better off. As it turns out, that animal is very riled up and very upset uh, when it's getting off the truck and going into uh, a pen and then going into the slaughter floor. That animal gets there the day before, especially if there are other cattle within that facility or within that same pen. By the next day, that animal is much calmer much uh, easier to work with. Now, if, if you're walking an animal right out of a field into a mobile slaughter unit, obviously that's you know not going to affect them too much if you're working with those animals. But you know we we see in slaughterhouses some beefers that never are handled, that are put out in fields and are just literally like wild animals. So I, I think that that's uh, depends upon the situation, but it's it's not a the, the, one of the big problems with slaughterhouses is the throughput. You know, you need to be able to push enough animals through on a daily basis to be able to cover your overall costs. And some can do that, but it really depends upon the situation. We would, from our, from our perspective, a mobile slaughter unit would be the last resort, and that is after you've gone through a major feasibility study to really determine if a if it's needed. I hope that answers some of that. Yeah, no, that's that's good. I I currently have your slides from the um, previous webinar up. I don't know if you want to um, if, if these are useful to, to talk about now or. Well, I, I think that the, some of this I I touched on. Again, these are mobile slaughter units. Um, you know, there, there are some folks who are looking at trying to replicate the Lopez Island model. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, it, it is possible. Um, if you are in areas where there are many restaurants or farms that have what we call 20C licenses, and Arian can uh, mention if that's what they call them in other states, but a 20C license is like what a grocery store or a restaurant or a farm has that can actually take a USDA stamped carcass and process it further into individual cuts. Uh, if you have a mobile slaughter unit that can actually go to farms or uh, places that have these 20C licenses and offload these carcasses where they can then hang them and age them and process them further, then obviously you don't need the USDA processor. Um, and, and in those cases, then a, a mobile slaughter unit might work very well. But you definitely still need a, a place to hang these animals. And I, and I talked about this a little bit in my previous webinar, the, the need for height and your yield will be better if you can maintain that carcass as a side of beef rather than quartering carcasses. Because as that quartered carcass ages, there are pieces of that that have to be cut off from the outside. And if you're quartering, then you're quartering at the rib and you're losing a good half of an inch, to, uh, if not more, of a steak in the middle of your carcass. And your yields just aren't as much and thus your profits aren't as much. So height is is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Arian or Steve, do you have any experience in your areas with mobile processing units, mobile slaughter units? Steve, go ahead if you got yeah, some points. Arian, we, we have a mobile processing unit in New Mexico, and it was built without uh, the 
consideration that Chris is describing, there was no cut and wrap. So it sat for quite a while. And then a cut and wrap was built to work with it. But there wasn't really a clear market for product coming out of that cut and wrap. Um, so uh, the, the, the mobile processing unit has been sort of sporadically deployed. And although it's been quite the poster child for supporting small agriculture and on-farm functionality, I don't think it's had the economic impact that it might have if it was part of the kind of systematic regional approach that Chris is describing. Um, one success we have had with the MPU in New Mexico is that we, have, um, we don't have to run an awful truck around to gather the waste product. We have an on-farm um, composting protocol that was developed. So we've had, our MPU has had really good support and cooperation from USDA as well as from the state environment department. Um, but the bigger issue is once you kill and hang that animal, then what? And if the then what hasn't been figured out in general to create marketing opportunities, then the MPU isn't going to create marketing opportunities that don't already exist. And it isn't going to create flow through from the farm or ranch all the way out to an end user if that doesn't already exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, there's certain situations where they're particularly useful. Um, you know, Lopez, I, Lopez, I, L, excuse me, Lopez Island is a good example. Um, field harvesting buffalo because they're such a wild animal is a good example. Um, but if, it, if it's not overcoming coming some other kind of technical f obstacle, uh, such as nobody will let you site a slaughterhouse in your area, which was what happened in Lopez Island, um, in addition to other things, then they, uh, uh, it may not be the most cost effective way. And Jeff, I would just also jump in real quick and say, we're talking red meat, mobile slaughter units. When it comes to poultry, mobile slaughter units are actually very effective because you don't require the hanging time in the cooling facilities. You have to cool the carcasses of chickens as well, but that can be done in, in coolers with ice. Uh, you know, that's, so, so mobile poultry units where it is the slaughter and the processing is done all within that same trailer type of system, those are, those are very effective. And we've seen that uh, in, in many areas. Again, like with red meat slaughterhouses, it's a matter of throughput. Poultry slaughter, you, you need to be hammering a good 75 to 150 through stationary plants to really make it worth your while. And most people don't want to fire up a, a, a poultry slaughter plant for a couple hundred birds. You know, they want 500, 800, 1,000, 2,000 birds to make it worth their while in cleaning it all up. Mobile uh, poultry slaughter can be a little bit less. The cleanup is a little less uh, obtrusive. But uh, again, you'd still want to be, you know, pushing through a number of birds to make it worth your while. I completely agree with that. I think that's a really good point, Chris. Good. Um, okay, Mark has a question about um, scaling up uh, niche animals. So I'm just going to read his question here. He, he asks if, you, if uh, any of you know if the National Pork or National Beef Boards have researched um, the uh, new product attributes that are being seen in the niche markets, grass-based, 100% grass-fed, heritage porch, etc. He says that uh, he has a lot of small producers in Vermont working in niche, but not sure if they scale up um, if the broader markets will actually have a demand for these products. All the more reason not to build a plant until you go, until you can state <laughs> the demand, until you can show the demand. Because I mean, literally, uh, you know, Lawrence meets. Uh, if one out of 20 phone calls pans out about somebody who actually shows up with animals, I mean, literally, we get calls every day from somebody, oh, I'm going to bring in a bunch of animals, I'm starting this new branded program, it's going to be a really big deal. Um, and if one of 20 of those pans out, we're happy. Um, because there's the difference between stated demand and real demand is huge. Um, and so all the more reason to... to Send some animals to some plant, even if you've got to send it a long ways away, to build that demand that you are trying to cultivate. Because there, to, you know, there may be some studies on niche pork and this, that, and the other thing, but ultimately, at the end of the day, um, 
you don't pay people with studies, you pay people with cash, and to have cash you've got to sell stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For, if you, from the perspective of a, a say a non-profit uh, looking to assist um, farmers in uh, having a pr more uh, sustainable business, um, you know, I, I, I can imagine them saying, hey look, there's, there's profit to be made with these uh, niche products. The question is, okay, now if I have enough land to be a mid-sized producer and I, I go, so to speak, whole hog with these niche products, am I going to be out of luck? Am I not going to be able to sell into, into the market? So um, I, I don't know if any of you have experience in the, sort of looking at these large um, uh, uh, you know, interest groups that represent the, the large scale buyers, but if you, if you do, would be interested to hear um, that perspective. Okay. I'm so, no, no, Jeff, I'm sorry. No, I, sorry. I, I, I hope the folks understand that we're also reading questions while yeah, right. other people are talking. Right. So we're, I get a little distracted because normally I'm not looking at all these bells and whistles on my computer screen. Um, yeah, could, you cl could you clarify your question, Jeff? Just like reiterate it kind of? Um, yeah, let's, let's actually, um, let's, let's try this here. I'm going to let, I'm going to unmute Mark here and see if he can uh, give can his I question. Can to Mark's question before you bring him on, Jeff? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Mark, Mark is making the obvious observation that there are national associations who do a lot of market development and a lot of advocacy for the different proteins, mm -hmm. and he's wondering whether those organizations have looked into some of the positive attributes of niche markets. And I just want to point out that, that the challenge of those larger organizations taking on niche markets is our tendency to define um, the niche market as good and the existing system as evil. And when that uh, it, uh, presentation is made, it kind of tells the national organizations that we are not partners with them. We are actually competitors in some way to them. Um, so, for example, in the case of the... The, the national beef organization, one of the ways I like to language that is to say, you know, we're all grass farmers, we just have different opinions about when to take them off grass and why and what to do next. So, uh, I think if we want to, as niche producers, to engage the support of the national boards, we want to recognize that um, all of the different styles or strategies for protein production and finishing probably have a place in the market and that we are part of that continuum rather than, you know, the ultimate and superior alternative to something else that already exists. Okay. Um, so, um, Marcus, let me know that he doesn't have a mic, so he's going to, uh, we'll, we'll table that um, for now, um, and he was, he's going to write uh, more de uh, description. But, um, Chris, a question for you. Um, Rachel asks, what market options are there for grass-fed beef direct marketing when the o only local processing option is with a great but small non-USDA inspected processor who doesn't have the volume or other area production to necessitate USDA inspection? Are there solid legal avenues for direct market in this case? Well, I assume you're talking about a, a, a non-USDA inspected processor being a custom exempt processor, that it's okay for um, a, a animal to be owned by somebody or a portion of an animal to be owned by somebody to be killed and processed at this plant, but it's all stamped not for sale. And those are the types of custom exempt plants that we have here in the Northeast. Um, in New York, you can have 16, up to 16 people own a beefer, and I believe also own a, a, a hog. And that's actually a, a, a good thing, especially for folks in New York City or Boston who don't have large freezers. So the, the market option, and I, I spoke about this in my other webinar, is, is basically selling a live animal or selling a side of beef uh, or a quarter of a beef or an eighth of a beef or a sixteenth of a beef. And then you're not marketing those into retail outlets or restaurants or farmers markets where you have to have the USDA stamp. This is also a need to, to educate the consumer 
of the benefits of buying larger amounts. And, and Arian has put, Arian and Mike Lorenz have put together a great document on, on buying sides of beef, uh, which we also referenced in our last webinar. And I'm sure if you contacted Arian, he could get that to you, or with the Niche Meat Processors Association Network. Um, there's a belief out there, especially amongst a bunch of foodies, that in freezing meat, you diminish the quality of it, uh, that you always have to have fresh meat. And as a person who pulls steaks out that are a year or so old from my freezer, I don't notice that any difference whatsoever. Um, there's less of a carbon footprint when it comes to going out to your freezer and getting your evening dinner rather than driving to the grocery store. Uh, but there's a, so there's a real need to educate the consumers about the benefits of buying a side of beef or a quarter of a beef. And those small non-USDA plants can produce those for you. And uh, it's just a matter of educating those consumers out there uh, about that. I, I hope that answers your question. Okay. And, and Arian might want to comment on that as well. I, th I think you got it pretty good there, Chris. I mean, I, okay. I strongly agree with that. And you know, it's it's you want to. It's a good way to have a low transaction cost sale that both benefits um, you, it benefits the producer, and it benefits the consumer in the economics of that. And you showed in the last webinar, you had some great numbers that you put up there that illustrates that very clearly. Chris, can you go into a little more detail to explain how it is that 16 families can own a beef and how that transaction walks its, walks through to completion? Well, yeah, and and that becomes a another issue because in the in the in the classic history of of buying a beef or when you're buying a side, then that's easy. Historically, when you were buying a quarter, you were buying a front quarter or a hind quarter, uh, which becomes you know. A, a bit more difficult because people aren't getting the the stakes that they want necessarily. When I break up an animal, even amongst uh, 16 folks, it's all done fairly evenly. Um, uh, to make it easier for, for myself, I tend to cut all stakes at about one inch so that I have more of them that, rather than my typical inch and a half T-bones or porterhouses. Uh, there are, you know, I tend to make top round steaks rather than London broils. Um, I tend to make uh, uh, stew meat out of some pieces that there won't be enough to break it up in the 16 different sections. If I'm doing it, you know, to be honest, I, 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 don't, I don't often do a lot of 16 owners on a beefer or a, or a hog. I, I do eight, and, but typically I'm doing two or four. And when I'm breaking that up in for four or even eight, then I am literally looking at four or eight boxes and putting a steak into each box, making sure that there's one, putting a roast into each box. And then you will eventually get to certain cuts that there's just not enough of them. I mean, you can look at sirloin tip roast, that you're only going to get four off of an animal. So are you going to, you have to kind of, you know, judge it and, and balance it. Um, and maybe with some folks you give them more ground beef or you give them the flank steaks and those people get, you know, at the flanks and the skirts. And and sometimes that's a that's a bit of a discussion. I, I do think also in Arian and Mike's uh, handout on this, there's there's some pretty good descriptions on, on how to kind of break that stuff up. Um, but it, it, in, inevitably you're not always going to get people that are happy with what they get. But there are also some really neat models for meat CSAs, like the piggery out of Ithaca that does in New York City, where on a weekly basis they're butchering a, a hog, and then every week you're getting a different cut from that hog. Um, now those are USDA, um, or, or 20C as I understand it, but you could do the same thing with a 16 people on a beefer, where on the next beefer that they buy, the people who didn't get those cuts rotate into getting those cuts. So there are there are ways to work around it. Chris, I was just thinking of the mechanics because, as I understand it, the, the processing fee, for example, in a state plant or a custom exempt plant, has to be paid by the owner of the beef, not who at that point is not the rancher. So how do we look yeah. at coordinating the, 
the, the transactions and the physical movement when we have a live animal that you or I grew, but ultimately force eight or whatever number of families are going to claim a piece of it and are going to be identified as owners. I mean, I was just thinking it might help some folks to get a better handle on how that direct marketing works if they saw actually how the process walks all the way through and who does what for who. Well, I, I mean, I guess in the sense of paying for it, most of the time those, the folks within the city, uh, it's being freighted down to them. Um, so either the, the slaughterhouse is waiting on the check or the checks have arrived for, uh, you know, in, in advance. And so, you know, you're looking at a, uh, let's, let's, you know, look at a 600 some odd dollar bill or, uh, or a, a 500 uh, dollars for processing. You know, a lot of our slaughterhouses just aren't going to release the meat till they have the money. Uh, no meat, no money is on several signs at our slaughterhouses. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's what you're what you're getting at, but they can they can certainly have the animals loaded onto a distribution truck and freighted down to them. Um, and in some cases, there's uh, as I've understood it with some of the distributors, they've actually paid uh, to release the meat, and then it's it's COD, uh, and people pay a little bit more for that. Um, yeah. But there, there are questions about some of this. I mean, they've definitely tried to set up the same type of a CSA on raw milk dairy, and that's been questioned. And I think that, to be quite honest, not, not everybody really owns the live animal and goes out to the farm and is looking and saying, I want that beefer, and this group of 16 people are going to own it. They are setting it up with the farmer that we own this beaver. It's going into a custom exempt plant. They never lay eyes on it, and then the checks just pass hands. I mean, that's, that's really yeah. what happens. I know that in the case law that's come up around this, and I think maybe this Steve is alluding to this, is that uh, normally the way that it's been determined is was does this qualify for a custom exempt sale? Is was the processor paid directly by the final end consumer? Um, and so it means that then when the animal goes into the meat plant, that person is their name is on the bill, and that the check or the payment comes directly from them. And if you do that, that's a way of keeping it legal. I would also make one comment: is that in New York they say 16, in Minnesota, Iowa they say oh, probably shouldn't be more than cut up into eight portions. And so there may you may see some discrepant some variation, I should say, from state to state, and the number of uh, people's name that can be. Uh, owners of that animal. I was just thinking, Arian, as a processor, I don't know how it would work for you to wait for eight checks. Or are most of the folks, or are we, 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 we um, mostly we won't go smaller than quarters typically. Um, and this would be everything we do is inspected, but still we will quarter. We will do a a split side or a half of a half, so you get a good balance of the cuts, and. Um, on an order basis. One thing that we also do to facilitate that is every individual order we put a $10 order charge onto just to help with all the paperwork being shuffled around. So, um, you know, if we got the meat, nobody picks up before the stuff's paid for, though. That's, I think that's pretty standard. And, and I would also just jump in and say when a carcass is broken up into quarters or beyond, uh, unless you want to pay more, um, you should still have it processed as though it was one animal or two sides. When you start trying to get T-bones uh, on one side at an inch and a half and T-bones on the other side at one inch or you know, boning out this or boning out that and you have all these special orders, at least with the slaughterhouses in the New York area, will start to charge you five to ten cents more per pound on cut wrap and freezing if it starts to become this really complicated, convoluted mess of how you're, you're processing that. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, uh, one of our attendees, says that uh, they will split into eighths, but it has to be a standing cut across the entire beef, and they charge for the split. Um, uh, in terms of uh, creating a, a 
a processing facility um, run by a cooperative. Um, have you seen that be a successful model? I, I've not, uh, in the Northeast, I've not seen a, a single slaughterhouse set up by a cooperative. By a cooperative, okay. There's the, 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 in the Midwest. There's one. There's uh, the the one mobile unit that I know of that is a real success story, and it's often referred to. It's the Lopez Island one. Uh, they are set up as a cooperative. It's Island Grown Farmers Cooperative, and I would have. They are a very savvy bunch. Uh, a lot of business experience. Um, they do it very very well. That said, uh, there are some other examples uh, that I actually keep a rolling list of of. of uh, uh, basically, producer started processing plant. The the six the trend of producer started processing plants, whether cooperative or otherwise, is that they rapidly go out of business. As a general general trend, just a comment. And, and I think I commented on that in the last webinar that a, a lot of times slaughterhouses that are started by farmers do not survive. Um, most of the ones that most slaughterhouses that do survive were typically folks who were in the meat business and uh, it's a family run operation and those are the ones that that have the most chance for success. That's not to say that it couldn't happen with some farmers as as Lopez Island but as, as Arian alludes to those are some savvy people and uh, it's it's different to learn the the meat cutting up business than the meat than the cattle growing business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mark was able to give us a, a bit more clarification on the question earlier about uh, niche meat and Vermont. Um, I'm summarizing here. Um, essentially, he wants to know um, if someone else has already done the market research to make sure that there is a good market for grass-fed and, uh, and um, heritage pork breeds and this sort of thing. So are, are, there, are there the um, national groups that have this data already so they don't have to re redo the feasibility study? And maybe there's only regional data. All right. I, I, I guess we don't know. Well, I, I guess I would say that one of the problems that you run into is is that there's not enough. Um, you know, to try and get into particular markets, there's just not enough of those those what we would call niche meat mar niche meat products. So there's a reason why uh, you know Wegmans is sourcing, which is a grocery store here in the Northeast, grass-fed beef out of Argentina. Uh, you know, there's just not enough grass-fed producers that have it on a regular basis. Um, and there's not a lot of those companies that are forming and uh, assuring the farmers that those markets uh, would be there. Um, so it, it continues to stay a niche type of a business. Um, I would think that there is a tremendous amount of research on the demand side. Um, there was a, an RFP put out by New York City school systems uh, to find producers for grass-fed beef, and one farmer responded to it. Um, so you know their response is okay. We're gonna we're gonna look elsewhere besides upstate New York because there's obviously not enough. And it might have been that they didn't put that RFP out far enough and far-reaching enough. I'm not quite sure. But you know there there is the demand out there. It's the question of you know, which came first, the beefers or the demand? And it's, it's just not that, that easy to build that scale uh, to meet that demand uh, immediately. And you're, you're also talking when it comes to beef, you know, you're, you're looking at three years of a pipeline of the gestation period and the, the growth of the animal. And are you going to assure those farmers that that market is going to be there in three years? So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult... Um, item to get it up to, it's a difficult issue to get it up to that scale that I think that he's talking about. Yeah, one one other thing just to add, and I completely agree with the points that Chris has made, is that also, it's also important to remember demand at what price? Because I could mm -hmm. tell you that the demand for grass-fed beef at 50 cents a pound for ground beef, man, the demand is huge. Uh, 
the ground, the price, uh, the demand for grass-fed beef at you know ground beef at eight dollars a pound, uh, not so much, you know. So just to you know maybe in the you know that I just think that those are really important because you know just to sort of those economic supply and demand curves, it's a curve for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Susan wanted to uh, just make the point that um, with the cooperative model for processors, um, it, it seems like it, it's all about hiring the right manager. Um, and so it's not, it's not the, the co-op model necessarily, um, but just making sure that, that the, the right hires are done. Um, and Michelle has uh, a question for recommendations for uh, selling all of the cuts. So uh, she's working with a grocer that only wants to purchase certain cuts, chuck and rib and loin and whatnot. How, how, do you, uh, how do you make sure you sell the whole animal? Um, I, I'd like to hear from Steve if he has anything on, on yeah, that. We, we've been addressing that problem in our little grass finished value chain here and um, what we're, we do find that retail really prefers certain cuts and food service prefers certain other cuts and then sometimes you have a different place, a different type of customer for trim and grind and maybe even some of the stew meats. So if, if, we're, if a, um, a marketer is wanting to maximize carcass utilization without uh, a cattle pack program, you know, where we're, we're breaking the animal down, the bottom line is that we will need different types of customers for different parts of that animal. And the food service and restaurant customer is very complementary to the retail grocery customer. So I think that um, folks that are fine, that have a good retail customer as their foundation um, uh, outlet Need to comp, need to get out and look for either a food service distributor. Um, it could could be a major distributor who goes to a lot of restaurants, or possibly develop relationships with a few restaurants directly in order to get the rest of that um, carcass out into into the onto a plate. Steve, how many head do you move a year through your um, through your program? Well, we started with two or three a week, and we're now you know we were strictly going cattle pack from the processor to the cooperative retail stores. And the stores were holding the responsibility to move everything that came in. Um, that strategy had really caused a plateau in sales at the retail level because there were gains in some cuts and losses in other cuts. And the meat department wasn't really be able to grow sales because it had to kind of balance the wins and losses. When the cooperative warehouse that's part of this value chain got involved and started building customer, uh, food service customers, now we're seeing again growth in the retail side because they can be more selective about which cuts go to retail. And we're developing, you know, case by case, we're developing restaurant outlets for the particular cuts that retail um, isn't as successful at marketing. So we're, get, we're now fairly quickly starting to see growth um, towards the, the three and four a week level. But at that point, we're now, like Chris always says, we're, we can't we can if if we ramp up sales too quickly, we don't have animals to fill that order at the quality we want because it takes 18 to 24 months to build up our our, um, our, our herd. And, yeah. and I would touch and go you know, between balancing the rate of growth in bringing more animals through the system um, and you know finding customers who can accommodate that relatively slow rate of growth. And I would comment a couple things. I, I'm, I'm surprised that they have trouble selling the sirloin, for one. But, but if they are, at least the guy's buying the ground beef. So you may have to eat the idea of, of grinding your sirloin, which is uh, difficult for me to even grasp that idea. But this is one of the issues that we deal with with kosher uh, for, for folks that um, sell kosher. Kosher beef is only from about the 13th rib forward. They don't want anything back from that. So if you wanted to sell kosher beef, in a, and there's a big demand for kosher uh, meat and kosher beef out here in the Northeast, you have to find a, another market for the other half of that animal. And typically with kosher, you're talking about grass-fed animals. So you have to have another market. 
for those grass-fed animals. We've experienced this with several restaurants, several retail outlets who want the middle meats. And Bob Perry out of Kentucky talks about this, the difficulty of what do you do with the ground beef and the roasts. And because everybody's used to the ribs, the, the T-bones, the porterhouse, the sirloins, and it's, it, it really becomes an, es an issue of education. And I know that that's, that's kind of difficult and not really getting to the answer of it, but we've had sit-downs with restaurant owners to explain that, you know, they're not, these animals are made out of other products. I mean, there was one client who wanted just T-bones. And when they said, okay, we can give you T-bones, well, what else do you want? And they go, no, just, we just want T-bones. Well, you know, that's not the case of a cow. <laughs> I mean, there's just other pieces. And there, are, there is some movement in this arena, uh, especially amongst foodie circles. Uh, I can't remember the, the chef's name, Ferguson, who's, you know, it's the nose to the tail. It's the idea of, of looking at even the organ meats and, and everything and developing the recipes and cooking all of that. Um, unfortunately, there's just a, a real ignorance on the, on the level of what the other meats can bring. So I, I would say to her also, trying to educate the grocer, and if the grocer says, yes, but my customers won't, won't buy that stuff, and then try to set up a display within that grocery to educate folks about those other cuts of meat, how they can be cooked, and, and how they can, can also, maybe even at a lower price, serve as a very good meal. But, but this is, she's touching on an issue that is a, a huge problem of the parts of the animals that people don't want. Yeah, can, if if I if there's time, I'd just like to add my two cents on that one. Too. Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that it's in that publication that Chris mentioned about doing direct marketing for a small scale producer, uh, and I posted the the link for that in the chat box. Is that uh, we find and and Steve has a really good setup where he's working with a, a marketing cooperative, if I understand you correctly, Steve, where they are marketing other items as well. Is that correct? Well, we have two cooperatives. We have a producer co-op that's growing the beef, and we have a consumer co-op with a chain of retail stores and a warehouse that reaches out to independent retails and food service. So, it's really so, so great, because, because they've... Go ahead. Sorry, on. Um, no, 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 no. So really, I mean, you, that's great because you have the, that retail co-op which is willing to take over some of the handling, uh, marketing, and distribution transactions that would be associated with essentially developing a, a branded program, if you will. Um, and what, so one of the general rules of thumb that we've seen here at Lawrence Meats working with a number of branded programs is that, and I know folks are going to be a little shocked to hear this, is that a thousand animals a year is the volume that you should look at having before you develop, before you even begin, minimum volume to develop a branded program. And the reason for that being is that in order to develop your own branded program, you need warehouse space, you need warehouse managers, you need drivers, you need people to work just on marketing, you need other people, you know, you need operations, you need to cycle inventory. Um, all of those functions and all of that cash that goes into there, and it is a huge endeavor, um, require that kind of throughput. Um, and the reason we say that is because we've just seen a lot of people who, who get stuck in this conundrum where they don't, they are, in addition to raising beef full time, they also are then marketing full time on the weekends or spending a bazillion hours a week at farmers markets and um, they're doing all these jobs and trying to get them all done and frankly not doing any of them very well and getting burnt out and feeling frustrated and maybe they have some person who does part-time this and part-time that and that person doesn't really specialize in either one. It's sort of like that old uh, adage that says, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And so in order to run a quality branded program, you need people that are really good at some of those, you know, managing the warehouse, making those deliveries, taking sales, making sales, you know, doing financial management. Um, and so in order to get up to that where you can all of a sudden afford to then go out and talk to people who are in, in institutional sales, hotels, restaurant institutions, work with retailers, work with restaurants, have all those market segments and do a good job marketing to all of them and then balancing all your cuts, 
you really need to have that kind of throughput. And so I think, Steve, you have an excellent example where you've been able to form a really good relationship with the consumer co-op that, that works well with you to take, un, take some of those, uh, those job duties under their umbrella, which they have infrastructure for and are managing other items. But to do it all on itself, uh, I think it would be very challenging uh, and have seen many people try and, and not get very far with that. Well, the producer co-op on the ha, was originally intending to do all the things you described, and they saw the advantage of partnering with the consumer co-op um, because it allowed them to get more effective distribution at the smaller volume. So you're quite right. The volume that we're at now of 150 to 250 head a year would not be in any way sustainable for that producer co-op to market themselves. Um, the, a lot of their efficiency uh, in, in selling the meat is achieved by partnering with a marketing and retail and distribution partner. Yeah, sounds like a really good setup. Mm -hmm. Well, I also um, wanted to Chris, say on a comment, okay. just to Chris, you know, I agree with you that consumer education about um, the value of all the cuts from nose to tail is absolutely key. That education also helps us sell eighths and quarters and sides. Um, at the same time, in practical terms, um, I can tell you that after four or five years of doing cattle pack in our retail stores, we were not, and, and we've got you know, a, a loyal membership base who is very committed to the local grass-finished beef program. We really didn't solve the problem well enough to grow our beef sales. And when we took some of those cuts out of retail and found um, uh, food service homes for them, then almost immediately, um, margins, sales increased in the retail side, and prices went down because there was less waste, less grinding of sirloin, and that sort of thing. No, it's good to know. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, we are we're getting we're we're at time, so um, I I don't want to uh, leave the webinar, however. Uh, without um, noting that um, our presenters are resources uh, for you. You've probably taken down uh, their contact information. Um, there was a question from Helen about uh, how do you uh, get help uh, generating a feasibility for a slaughterhouse and are, are there cases that can be find, found? Um, Arian, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about the uh, Nishmi Processor Assistance Network site. Um, if, if you want, because there are several resources such as that on, on there, um, and I want people to know about that, that resource. So if you want to take just two minutes to talk about the sort of thing that's on the site. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, just so one of the, so I work at Lawrence Meats. I also still work for a cooperative extension a little bit, which is where I worked before I came to Lawrence Meats. And we have a network of folks that are in small, uh, that work with small processors in different states. And these folks are an extension or State Departments of Agriculture, and um, this is this is a website for that network right here. We have a lot of you know you see some of these tabs at the top, it tells you a little bit about it. If you're new to meat processing, it kind of gives you a little bit of an overview. There's a number of tools for businesses. Um, we have a couple different ways of different state listings. If you're trying to find out what processors might be in your states, we don't have every single state up there, but we got the overwhelming majority. Uh, the special section on mobile units. Um, some of the things that are in here, we've got a lot of information about rules and regulations. How you know how do you apply for a grant of inspection? Um, so you know how to apply for inspection. HACCP. We've got a number of case studies of various meat processors around the country talking about how they function, uh, their business models, kind of fees they charge, how they're um, you know how they find employees. Sort of those nuts and bolts kind of questions. Um, another thing that uh, focus on if you go under the uh, about NPAN to the left um, that says uh, find help in your state, the next one down, so if you actually click on that, is that there, again, there are folks, uh, we have about in 35 of the 50 states, these are people in, again, Cooperative Extension State Departments of Agriculture who will provide help to you, answer questions um, specific to your state at little, to, at no cost to very low cost. Um, so just to put that out there as a resource, I'd also encourage folks just to peruse through here, look at some of these sections, find some of these, uh, find some of these resources online, and uh, email myself or uh, Lauren Gwynn, who's the other co-coordinator of MPAN, who's probably on this webinar, and our contact information at the bottom of this webpage. We also are part of eExtension, which is uh, uh, 
cooperative extensions, national cooperative extension online effort. So um, yeah, that's that kind of gives you a little overview. Great. Thanks. Perfect. And I also I want to note that um, at the end of the webinar um, there will be a, a quick survey and one of the items on the survey is uh, do you want your information sent to say Chris Harmon at Cade? Uh, so it, that, that, is part, that is one of the services that they can provide um, and um, so it's sort of a quick easy way for you to uh, get get contacted um, and talk about um, services that they can provide. Chris, did you want to comment on that for a second? Uh, sure. Uh, certainly, uh, Cade is more than willing to, to assist people in feasibility studies and business plans uh, and, and, and really looking at uh, if, if, if you need a slaughterhouse. Um, and that's really throughout the Northeast. Although New York State is our base, we do get requests uh, throughout the Northeast to, to do some of this work. Um, it is a, an area of our expertise. Uh, I would also say that many of the questions that have been presented or were presented at the, uh, uh, in the last webinar uh, on Cade's website, we will also have answers to those questions probably up by the middle of next week. Um, and you could visit www.cadefarms.org. And as well as our Facebook page, and uh, we would be able to uh, answer those questions generally, but also specific questions as well. Um, I do think that MPAN is a great resource, particularly for those folks that are not, not in the Northeast, um, and it's a good place to start. There are several places, feasibility studies and business plans in particular are really specific to a, a site and a geographic location. And same as a HACCP plan as a boilerplate, it's good as a template or an idea, but it really comes down to the individual geographic region to determine you know, if this project is feasible. Do we need a slaughterhouse? Are there enough producers? What's the competition? You will find from many slaughterhouses across the country who, who feel like there, there is not a need for more slaughterhouses. There is just more of a need to, to spread the animals out throughout the year and to uh, reduce the feast and famine seasonality of, uh, of those slaughter facilities. Okay. Thank you. That, that's perfect. Uh, I want to uh, give our audience a, a, a quick um, introduction to uh, some of the other tools that the NGFN has to offer and some upcoming events. Um, and I want to thank our panel, Chris, Nicole, Steve, Arian, really uh, amazing, uh, really wide-ranging discussion, great information. Um, thank you so much. Um, and again, audience, feel free to contact them. Um, uh, MGFN webinars are the third Thursday each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, although as it turns out, we are for the first time since we began not having a webinar on the third Thursday of March. Um, but we do have a great lineup in April on good food in health and health care, um, and a national food hub study in May, and we're running a bonus webinar on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, featuring, featuring Warren Hesterman from the Fair Food Network. Um, as these illustrate, we focus on bringing me the best models and ideas around scaling up good food. Again, we do record and archive all our webinars, and this one will be available on our site within a few business days. If you uh, would like to review the webinar or share it with a colleague, it will be up at ngfn.org slash webinars, and you can go to that same web page as we open registration for our upcoming webinars. Uh, we have made it easier for you to find uh, the webinars of interest. We've organized them in topics over there in the uh, left-hand navigation area. Again, ngfn.org slash webinars. As I mentioned in the opening, the Wallace Center NGFN has become a, a cooperative agreement with USDA Agricultural Marketing Service to understand and support food hubs or local regional aggregation facilities. Um, as a first step, Wallace uh, and a team of other organizations, uh, including the Project for Public Spaces and the National Association for Produce Marketing Managers, uh, is trying to identify all the food hubs in existence. Again, uh, uh, management structure facilitating the aggregation, storage, processing, distribution, and or marketing of locally regional, regionally produced 
food products. So we're not just talking about produce here. Meat uh, absolutely qualifies. So uh, if you are part of a food hub or think you are or know someone who is, uh, go to bit.ly. Com, oh, sorry, bit.ly slash myfoodhub uh, or uh, ngfn.org. There's a, there's a link right from the front page and just let us know about your, um, your venture. Uh, we also want to let you know about three other upcoming opportunities centered around local regional meat. Chronologically, first, uh, NGFN Partner Network, the National Farmers School Network, is offering a webinar on meat in a, uh, uh, in a week, about less. Uh, March 8th, 1 p.m. Eastern, they will present success stories on getting local meat into school cafeterias. And there's also a section on brainstorming ways to leap hurdles that you may have faced uh, in this work. The first annual North Carolina Meat Conference is towards the end of March. Getting together different actors in the value chain, they hope to build regional opportunities in sustainable and artisanal meat. Um, and in early April, there's a webinar offered by the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. Small and mid-sized meat processors are increasingly asked by their customers to go through third-party audits for a range of standards and practices on this webinar. Auditors explain what to expect from and how to prepare for audits for good manufacturing practices, GMPs, food safety, animal welfare, and certified organic. A processor with uh, a lot of audit experience will also offer tips and uh, perspective. Uh, there's no registration required. Uh, just visit the website listed here. Um, and I'm sure from the uh, NMPEN site you can get there as well. Uh, the Wallace Center and NGFN plays its role as convener next in Detroit. Oh, go ahead, Arian. Do, do, do you want to? No? OK. Um, uh, the the processing.org. Yes. OK, for, for the webinar. Um, so uh, as convener, uh, NGFN is bringing together uh, a, a participant-driven, action-oriented uh, group of people for a conference. Uh, participants will form into teams around 10 to 12 real-world projects uh, or businesses and around three to five general distribution issue areas, which have been now selected. Um, if you go to www.makinggoodfoodwork.com, you can see uh, the, the groups. Participants will work together for the duration of the conference in these teams to help build actual businesses, solve existing business challenges, develop research projects, and identify best practices to help tackle the challenge of local and regional food distribution logistics, infrastructure, and transportation. Uh, for more background, uh, makinggoodfoodwork.com. This is really innovative and exciting conference. You may never have attended anything like it. Uh, you can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, your bio, and other information to our growing database of people, organizations, and funders, increasing your ability to connect to people within your re region and nationally. This is uh, just a part of the NGFN continuing to act as a connector. Look for the database link on the resources section of our site or ngfn.org slash database. And if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage or you can let us know in the post webinar survey and we'll sign you up. Uh, please contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. Uh, and the NGF, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out the survey. And if you uh, do want to be connected about consulting work, uh, the survey is the place to do it. Thank you very much. And uh, this ends the webinar. Oh, wait.